by my first tattoo in Coney Island. I wanted a skull and crossbones like the pirate flag, you know. Oh, and the guy showed me a stencil, a skull and crossbones. Oh, skull and crossbones. I was the pirate that I wanted to be. It was a, a kid's dream. It was my dream. I was living here. I've always classified tattooing as the, about the world's dumbest hobby. <laughs> it's a goddamn ordeal getting tattooed over. You gotta sit down after you paid for it and take it. So if you see somebody with a tattoo, it's a given. He sat there and took it. So he's joined a, well, it used to be an elite club. The coolest thing about tattooing was I had found my way into a real strange group of people. It was very, very special. You know, I came out of a 60s culture, you know. So to get away from that and meet all these really unusual guys, I really felt like something real special was happening to me, you know. I guess I knew that tattooing was going to get real popular. And of course, it went like wildfire. And, uh, and all the young ones talked the same way. Oh, I'm real dedicated. This is my life's work and all that. It's in black t-shirts, you know. I mean, I wouldn't trade one Jerry for a thousand of these black t-shirt kids. Oh, they sent for the Navy to come to Tulagi. The gallant Navy agreed. With 1,000 sections in different directions. My God, what a fucked up stampede. Fuck them all, fuck them all. The long and the short and the tall. Fuck all the admirals who give us the flack. They don't give a shit if we ever come back. We're saying goodbye to them all. As back to our rust pots we crawl. There'll be no promotion this side of the ocean. So cheer up, my lads, fuck them all. If you really want a true classic tattoo, you'll have to go back in time and cross the Pacific. When your tramp steamer hits the port of Honolulu, hop off and head straight to Chinatown. Soon you'll hit Hotel Street. You'll know this by the sudden progression of red poppin' hookers, boozed up sailors, and general sanctioned mayhem. That's where you'd find a man with a white t-shirt, an oily gray pompadour, and ink splattered Frisco jeans, known to all as Norman Keith, Sailor Jerry Collins. He's the man many see as the master of the deftly crafted, boldly lined, balls forward old school tattoo. The kind fueled by the devil may care appetites of men far away from home. He's the man who took these classic designs, known as Flash, and incorporated the Asiatic styles born from his years of travel on the high seas. To a generation of tattooers, he's simply just the man. Old Ironsides, Hori Smoku, Sailor Jerry. Sometimes I wonder, how did I ever get mixed up in all this shit in the first place? I think Jerry is one of the most important tattooers of the 20th century. I mean, the thing about what Sailor Jerry did is he was a pure, down-to-earth, tattoo artist. I mean, he, he took American designs and elaborated on them, made them his own. The standard that you, you gotta be up with nowadays. They called him a master of tattooing, and it was true. Yeah, it was like taking acid. It was like, Jesus, this is what tattoos can look like. They were so far beyond in their complexity and the sophistication, the layout, the colors, the whole thing. You know, it was just way beyond anything anybody had done in tattooing. And it was blowing minds of people all over the world. I was always just a step behind him because he lived in the same era I lived in. He actually lived in the era before I lived in. And his late eras was my, 
beginning errors and so many errors they put down second base. Second base is all right. If you're Jackie Robinson, steal third. What the fuck's the difference? That fucking sailor Jerry. That fucking sailor Jerry. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sailor Jerry was born on the edge of the American frontier at the turn of the 20th century. He was born in 1911. He's from Northern California. He was raised in the Sierra foothills. He was up from up around Ukiah, I think. He was a real hell raiser and uh, interesting guy from an early life, according to his account. Adventure came quick to the wild-eyed Jerry. By his early teens, he was off to see the world. He traveled around the country, as a lot of young guys did, kind of bumming around on boxcars. It was a sort of adventure. It was like pre-Beatnik, pre-Jack Kerouac on the road stuff. Yeah, that's where he started tattooing. He claimed he was tattooing by hand with, you know, handheld needles and whatever he could get for ink. And then he hit the Great Lakes area and ran into Tats Thomas, who was a famous Chicago tattooer and real character in his own right. Tats knew a guy that worked in the morgue. Jerry was a, you know, was was an apprentice, a green kid wanting to learn a tattoo. And they told him, well, the way you'll learn to tattoo is you, we tattoo stiffs at first. And they took Jerry down, got him in the morgue to tattoo a stiff. Well, the guy he tattooed was not really dead. When Jerry started to tattoo him, the guy started howling, scared him. <laughs> Jerry, it was a big joke, you know. <laughs> yeah. Tats was sort of the one that started Jerry off with machines, and he remained in touch with Tats forever. And Jerry learned to tattoo in the Chicago area. All the old tattooers that were on State Street, when that was a honky tonk area with arcades and that, tattooing in Chicago was controlled by the mob, and that's the way it worked. Fuck Chicago. A nightmare. I worked for the tail end of the syndicate from Al Capone. Holy Christ, nightmare. Jerry came out of the real straight-up American tattoo tradition that was formalized um, really probably in like around World War I. All American decorative tattooing really sprang from the Japanese example in the late 19th century when Europeans and Americans, people wealthy enough with enough connections, could go to Japan right after the country was open to the West after this hundreds of years of seclusion. So Westerners started getting these small souvenir tattoos from Japanese tattoo artists. And it was actually a real high society thing. It was expensive. They actually they brought in some Japanese tattoo masters to New York, to London, to work on people because it was a real exclusive deal. By World War I, it became a thing with like armed forces. There were tattoo parlors around in the West. This is what Jerry really drew from. It became a real working class thing, and then it particularly became a thing that the people in the, in the armed forces were getting, especially sailors. A lot of it was in, in towns where there were military. It tended to be in port cities. It tended to be in big cities in the US, uh, near bases, just as an economic thing, because young military guys were likely to get tattoos. That's where the tattoo shops would open. It was like sailor towns, somewhat in army bases, but for some reason the sailors and the marines seem to be the best customers. If you're in a situation where everybody has to be exactly the same, you live in exactly the same quarters, you dress exactly the same, it's a process of, of identity, it's individuation, like I'm going to say who I am via this tattoo. I really think tattoos are amulets. It's things that they like, things that they want to take on to themselves and, and gain those characteristics. Tattoos besides being amuletic in some sense, whether it's conscious or not with people. I think what hooked me when I was a kid, you go in the tattoo shop and the classic stuff was a little distillation of everything dramatic about life. And it had, you know, sadness and it had sex and death and longing and friendship and patriotism and resignation and, you know, all this humor and it was amazing. And guys would return with tattoos and they'd they were like heroes. So to me, tattoos, and they still represent romance, travel, adventure. They're really, to me, they're travel marks. The spirit of adventure is unquenched. A lot of times the tattoo shops were not uh, freestanding businesses. They were, in, they were in penny arcades. And of course, the carnies, tattooing was always associated with amusement parks. And the days before theme parks, it was all 
It was either carnivals, which are itinerant, traveling around, or places like Coney Island, or the Pike in Long Beach, which goes back to the late 19th century. And they would have these tattoo parlors there. Tattooers would drift around, and a lot of these places would amass tons of flash and machines. I don't know, it was just a whole different thing. It was a honky-tonk world. It was definitely a subculture. It was not a hipster thing. It was scary. People were like, oh, tattoos, it still had that, you know, like dark side of life thing, which is part of the fun of it. So Jerry was inspired by and followed the example of a lot of these earlier tattooers. And the main person that kind of codified American tattooing into this really bold look was uh, Cap Coleman, who tattooed in Norfolk, Virginia. Coleman was an interesting guy. At night, sailors would be out of town, be out of town. they'd go in there and they'd pee all, in, in, all over his front door all the time. So he fixed up a metal strip in there with a Model T coil and a and a battery. So if you pissed on that metal strip, you got a big shock, you know, and you're Johnson. Coleman developed a really, really strong style. It became known as the American style. It was hallmarked by really heavy, beautiful shading to distinguish the designs because the black is the, the pigment that lasts the longest in the skin. So Jerry took that as far as it could go in a really, really beautiful, well-composed, balanced style copying a lot of designs, as everybody did, of existing designs, and then mixing a lot of his own original stuff into the mix. There were no tattoo magazines, you know? I mean, nowadays, you can go to the newsstand and get five magazines and get a very good overall look at state-of-the-art tattooing that's going on all over the world, you know? You've got 500 designs to copy in every book you pick up. You couldn't do that back then. Every major city had a, a major tattoo artist in it. A lot of cities, that major tattoo artist happened to be the only one in the town. How many shops were there? Well, we used to, we used to say there's a hundred miles between a tattoo shop. It was a secret world. It was a really, really subterranean, outsider kind of an art. You know, you didn't just give stuff away, you know. And tattooers had closely guarded secrets. Jerry was as strong as any of them for trying to keep his stuff close to his chest. You only passed on certain information. He would send a rub off of the design to somebody. This was like a frottage. It's how we traded designs in the old days. We had these acetate stencils with, with basically a dry point line that you, you cut into that with a usually a, a 78 RPM phonograph needle and a pin vise. So we do rub offs of that and you'd get a line image of the thing and you'd trade that to other tattooers. Well he'd send off these rub offs with something wrong in it and he figured if the guy was fool enough to not correct it then the guy wasn't worth sending designs to you know or he just would laugh about it and keep sending him wrong stuff. In those days you'd hit a brick wall when you wanted to talk to somebody you wanted to be a tattoo artist. How could I learn this? Is you want to learn this? Is this, do you have a license? Is you owe get me two hundred and fifty dollars? So I went and I robbed the grocery store instead, and I gave the man the two hundred and fifty dollars, and I became a tattoo artist. I never looked back. But tattooing wasn't that prevalent in those days. Um, they all had sidelines. They'd either be a boot, bootlegger or I know one that was an abortionist. But. Um, now they have Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Problem with these guys today, they never had a real Liberty Port. I'm glad I was able to see Asia when it was the old way. Trouble with China is, when you had to clap over there, you really had to clap. Nothing we know would cure it. He itchy, he scratchy, cause he eats snatchy. Chinamen no likey. Hell of a world. An insatiable curiosity, what Buddhists call the monkey mind, led Jerry from the tattoo shops of State Street, Chicago, to the call of the open seas via the U.S. Navy outpost at Great Lakes. The sea, I think, was the overriding thing with Jerry, and he relished the sort of, of course, macho environment of it. He'd sailed on some sort of, uh, you know, canvas ships in some regard navigate one of them schooner ships that didn't have a motor or one of them big sailing ships. And the whole 
freedom of exploring the Pacific and then visiting these exotic ports because he had been to China, he'd sailed the China Sea, he'd been to Japan, he'd been to all these, these places in Asia, which fed his fascination with an appreciation of really Asian aesthetics. He talked about going down to Tahiti when the girls all still ran around half naked like that. But he loved the Pacific uh, and I believe that he got to Hawaii in maybe the late 20s, something like that. I, I remember he loved to say when he first got off the boat, the old timers had said, oh kid, they've wrecked the place, you should have been here in 05. So it's like always, you know, going on with the changes. He loved Hawaii. He never budged once he found Hawaii. He loved the physical presence of Hawaii. The real culture, the impact of Hawaii is, you know, what they call the Aina. Hawaii is further from any other landmass in the world. It's the one place where you really are out in the middle of the lake. He treasured that and he treasured being surrounded by that water and the cultures that came through there. You can speak pigeon, you know, to where he is almost, you know, untranscribable. Hey, Rob, where the five dollar poke stay? What? Where does the five dollar poke stay? Where are your five dollar tattoos, right? They always called it poke, I like poke one, Rob. After a while, you learn to speak it, you know? The tranquility and calm of this last outpost would soon be shattered by world events. Events that shape both Hawaii and Sailor Jerry's future. Before World War II, Hawaii was a, a relatively underpopulated place. I mean, I think there were less than half a million people on all the Hawaiian islands. It only had become part of the United States in the late 1890s. It was basically an imperial possession of the United States. But it wasn't a state, of course. They didn't get to vote. Again, very few Americans had ever been there. But when the Japanese bombed the place December 7, 1941, suddenly it was the heartland. Americans are remembering with vengeance in their hearts. Avenge December the 7th. On to victory. The Japanese hit it. They hit it hard because it was where America's naval projection in the Pacific was. And so Americans understood when they hit Hawaii, they were aiming at America's heart. And Americans suddenly said, yeah, Hawaii is us. Now, there had already been sailors there. There had already been soldiers there. So that was a familiar part of the landscape. But we're talking about a few thousand soldiers and sailors. By the middle of World War II, a million soldiers, sailors, and Marines were making their way through Oahu and Maui and the Big Island. Now, these were guys who had been indoctrinated to hate the Jap. I mean, for real, they were going to go over there and have to kill Japanese people. The Japanese are not easy to know. I've lived among them. The real difference is in their minds. Ever the one for patriotic adventure, Jerry immediately went to re-enlist in his beloved Navy. But the young Salt's ticker had already seen better days. Instead, Jerry found himself in the Merchant Marines, navigating supply ships through Japanese waters, which led to three ships being shot out from beneath him. This, of course, led to some extended shore leave with Jerry honing his machine skills. He had terrific stories of tattooing up by the uh, Air Force and Army base up in Wahiawa. They'd go up there on the Army paydays, and he said they tattooed on a front porch, and they would hang the flash off the porch rail and tattoo out on the lanai there and tattoo off batteries, you know? And they'd just tattoo them all and stay up there for a couple of days, and when the guys were broke, they'd come back down to Honolulu. Jerry tattooed in some of the arcades and then eventually opened his own shop, Tom and Jerry's, and I think the guy Tom, a Chinese guy, also was his partner in the photo booth deal where they'd take pictures of sailors against a painted backdrop of like a gra little grass shack, and his Chinese partner's wife would pose as the hula girl with the sailors. But Chinatown, Hotel Street, was the main action center. The fleet is anchored off Honolulu, the promised land of Liberty Party. Soon the glad cry of all ashore that's going ashore echoes throughout the ship, and eager sailors embark in ship's boats. You can imagine what it was like for a million soldiers and sailors to show up on this, this rock, as they called it. I mean, there were very few tourists there. But now you got a million guys with time to kill. And these are guys sometimes on their way to war, sometimes on their way back to war. They were not, like, looking for elegant, pretty, cute entertainment. And there was a whole district set up just for these soldiers and sailors. It was called the Hotel Street District. I worked on Street, yeah. I worked for a Filipino man named Muzzy Enos, who told me some fantastic stories about World War II and tattooing on Hotel Street. No, I ain't gonna tell you. 
<laughs> Men went there really for three simple reasons. They went there to get drunk, they went there to get sex, and they went there to get tattooed. Stewed, screwed, and tattooed. I mean, it was for real. That's what they did. Virtually all the tattooing in the old days was in downtown Honolulu in what they called Hotel Street area. It's Chinatown. It's where all the sailors poured in off the ships. In the pre-jet uh, airplane days where everybody come in, came in on a big luxury liner, they would spew out at Aloha Tower. The kids would be diving for coins there, and the laymakers were there. That's right at the base of where everybody filters up into Chinatown. Everything was available. Everything happened there. There was prostitution burlesque joints, whorehouses, bars. There were drugs, there was alcohol, there was gambling. Of course, there were tattoos. Hotel Street was a great place. They had the Hubba Hubba Club, which was a strip joint. All the way down the other end, there was a bunch of, uh, uh, what do we used to call them? They were guys, but they, they were dressed up like homosexuals. You know, they weren't really looking for girlfriends, they were looking for guy friends. It was a place where anything went, and it was catered to these soldiers and sailors. For too long, we have allowed a social taboo to prevent effective discussion and action. Boy! Everybody knew it. It was above board. There were lines down the street for brothels. Bars were kicking people in and out, drinking four shots of whiskey as fast as they could get them to spend their money. you got to imagine hundreds of guys swarming into a bar to get four drinks. That's the most you could get. It was a four-drink four max. And they gave them to you all four at once. You got four shot glasses, and you were supposed to go bang, 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 drink them and leave. There was no hanging out because there were 50 guys behind you who wanted their four shots. The other thing that I love about this is, you think of a bar, you think it's one o'clock in the morning. It's all in the daytime. These bars are closed at night. There's a curfew. I mean, it's wartime. There's, there's no lights on in Hawaii at night. So everything, the brothels, the drinking, the tattoos, it's the middle of the day. So you got drunken, whoremongering, tattooed men wandering up and down the streets in the middle of the day. And you can imagine how many fights there were. I mean, it's just unbelievable seeing the whole time. Did I ever have problems with Navy guys? Jesus Christ, where the fuck are you been? Maybe you should take a warm shower before you hit the sack, Bunce. Maybe you don't eat right. Could be the detail you're on's too tough. You know what you need is... Of course, in wartime, prostitution was legal, so all the cat houses were around that area. Here's the At the heart of the Hotel Street experience were the brothels. I mean, that's what made those places sing. There were 15 legal brothels in Honolulu, all located in the Hotel Street district. And these places were churning out several million dollars worth of business. I mean, each prostitute was supposed to service at least 100 men a day. 100 men a day. There were 250 licensed prostitutes in the Hotel Street district. I mean, do the math. It's, it's astronomical. Now, there were a lot of rules to keep these brothels and these prostitutes more or less in line. One, they paid income tax, which I think is hilarious. So you can find out exactly how much each madam made. Some of them made over a million bucks a year. I mean, there's records for all this stuff. It was a highly regulated business. I don't know, like legal gambling is today or something. I mean, just imagine again, this is a public thing. There's hundreds of guys waiting in lines up and down the street. And they're all doing the same thing. And they're all bullshitting each other. They're all talking to each other. They're making fun of each other. You only lasted 10 seconds. Uh, you went off in the pail. Uh, you didn't even get to her. I mean, it was just the world you were in. And why did they do it? You know, again, it was what you did. You were in the service. You got fucked. But also, think about it. These are guys, some of them on their way to Tarawa. They're on their way to Iwo Jima. I mean, they, they know they're going to hell. So a little piece of paradise before they go to hell is maybe par for the course. Let's show them we're as adult and intelligent as they are. Let that be our plan of conquest, the conquest of disease. One, one of my favorite parts about Hotel Street is there was like a ritual you're supposed to perform and then a ritual you actually did. So again, the Navy, the Army, they totally accepted the fact that these guys were going off to these brothels and getting laid. But by rules, you're supposed to immediately follow your brothel visit with a visit to the prophylaxis station. Oh, you see, that's all there's to it. Well, a lot of guys like blew off the prophylaxis station. They were so plastered or drunk at that point that overwhelmingly what they did instead was they got tattooed. And the tattoo part was, was really almost like the brothels. There'd be lines of guys down the street for the shops they thought were the best. 
Um, there was this kid, a Filipino kid, 14, 15 years old, uh, Eugene Miller, he was a famous guy. And there was Sailor Jerry, of course, and there were, there were dozens of other guys as well. These shops were swamped with people. There were more tattoo shops on Hotel Street. Every other store was a tattoo shop. They were like supermarkets, and people were just jamming tattoos on, you know. From morning to night, just constant, constant. You'd tattoo till there was no more clean needles to tattoo with. You know? And they'd all beg you, oh, just tattoo me with whatever you got in them. You know, they didn't give a shit. A lot of the thing about when you're in a dangerous thing, a military thing, the tattoo is, a, I'll get this tattoo, and maybe they find my body, they'll know who I am by the tattoo, or something like that. Or, you know, it's just that thing of, this is our last fling, we're gonna do this, or our first fling, our first real liberty. So it was a jumping off place. Everybody was drunk. You had to be drunk to go to work, I think. I used to, it used to be, you opened a tattoo shop, you wanted a bar right next door, because uh, while they were waiting to get their tattoo, they would be in the bar. And, and you'd stay in the bar, and you'd get drunk, and you'd tattoo the drunks, and you'd be drunk, and everybody was drunk. And you used to grab the guy by the shirt, pull him over the counter, and shake him upside down, get all that fucking money out of him. Uh, and then you'd sweep the floor and didn't tell him about that. <laughs> What I love is the going rate was the same as getting screwed. It was three bucks to get screwed. Basic rate was three dollars for a tattoo. It could run higher than that if you got something elaborate, but a simple tattoo, three bucks. One of the most common tattoos was definitely the broken heart. Hotel Street had a lot of broken hearted sailors on it. There's no way around it. One of my favorite stories, which is a true story, at least the guy tells me it's a true story, is that he went to his favorite brothel. He went to see his favorite prostitute at his favorite brothel. Her name was Judy. And he tries to give it to her for more than three minutes, but of course you can't do that, the rules don't allow it. And he says, Judy, that was the bummest fuck I ever had. And then he tells me, 40 years later, you know, I named my daughter after Judy. <laughs>Monkeys in tattoo shops, Jesus. And the story he told, which has become part of the great Jerry lore, Jerry came back to the shop and found the shop wrecked. He'd gotten in and thrown all this crap around and had drank most of a bottle of tattooing, Pelican ink, which is what everybody used to tattoo with then. And Jerry had finally got a hold of the monkey and he was roughing him up a little bit, you know? He had a hold of him and he was just giving him the business a little bit. And a sailor walked in in whites. Starch, fucking gleaming whites. Comes in, hey Jerry. Hey, what are you doing? Boy, what are you beating Romeo up? He says, here, you want him? Take him. The monkey jumped out with a scream, landed on Popsle, embraced him, and proceeded to shit, had diarrhea with this ink all over the guy. Jerry loved telling that story, and it's sort of a quintessential story about Jerry. He claims also that he tattooed the monkey, which is the basis of that old design of his, of a monkey bending over, looking through its legs, and says aloha with his asshole making the O in aloha. And uh, he swore that he tattooed the monkey that way. Guess I should look at my own attitude on the floor of the shop sometimes. I ain't the pleasantest son of a bitch in the world, I guess. But how much is that tattoo? Throws my ass in the revolution gear. What could you cover this with for three dollars? A band-aid, you fucking hooligan. Who's setting the price around here, me or you? 
He was well over six feet tall. He had some big fist fights in Honolulu years ago. I mean, two hours sometimes. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was amazing. There's a story about a guy one time came in and gave Jerry a bunch of trouble and took a poke at Jerry. Jerry used to wear these things called Frisco jeans. And they had these kind of square pockets and he used to have a buck knife in that. What it was was a gravity knife. It came right straight out the back. He was tricky with making it go quack. He wasn't afraid of nothing. And Jerry laid the buck knife up on his chest. The guy says, you're not going to cut me. Jerry said, zip. I'm coming. The kid completely flipped out blood every place. It's going crazy. And then Jerry sewed him up. Jerry claimed that the guy he brought him back another knife victim <laughs> like a few months later to be sewed up. He wasn't like a Pollyanna guy. Took his own teeth out when they went bad. Take a chopstick and hit it with a hammer. He was smoking a pipe in those days, and it certainly didn't contribute to his health. Jeez, you can't tell a man he can't smoke and drink. He'll kill you. <laughs> he, he had a dark view of life, you know, what I would call a realistic outlook. He really reflected that in his flesh, and he was a great one for slogans. You know, he would have these very funny things, these cartoons with really tongue-in-cheek kind of sarcastic remarks and there's a tradition of that among tattooing anyway it suited the people that were getting the tattoos i mean he just had a flair for it with, with a sense of humor that was unparalleled he found this this hokey painting in one of the chinatown shops of this a black velvet painting of like an old asian guy chinese guy with a long white beard and he was so happy when he he's like it's Greybeard, Greybeard's looking over my shoulder and I'm trying to just get in the right mood where he's gonna tell me what to do. To... It was very cool in the middle of all these blood and thunder, you know, fuck this and this asshole and all this stuff and these sea stories is mixed in this essential mysticism because he was totally understood. There's some kind of thing that comes through. You're like a transmitter for what's happening. You're not the guy that like, you know, made this thing happen. You didn't invent it. You sort of were there. I figured you're like a good camera. You're, you know, you're letting this thing come through. You get in a certain mental state. One famous painter said, uh, you know, if you're in the studio, you come in the studio, bring all these people in there with you. As you work, slowly they leave. And then if you're lucky at the end, you leave. And then you go into this like trance state. I think it happens when you're tattooing, when you're really into what you're doing with your craft. Every problem has an answer. I just have to wait until that old gray spirit stands behind me, taps me on the shoulder and says, try this. He never fails, but sometimes he is slower than hell. But above all, he really liked to cause trouble. He would use sailors as tools, as sort of deliverers of his particular brand of sadistic humor. In Hawaii, King Kamehameha is on par with Abraham Lincoln. There's a big Kamehameha Day parade, city goes apeshit. You know? Jerry and a couple of his buddies calm shot a baloney off of one of the ships and got a pair of coconuts. He climbed up on the King Kamehameha statue and he tied two coconuts and a big long bologna, you ever see these together, around King Kamehameha's waist. In the morning when everybody showed up, here's Kamehameha with this big wazoo, and it was like, I mean, it, it was a full investigation. It, it hit the papers, everybody was real upset. He loved to do shit like that, he was like amazing. <laughs> I like the idea of controlling the brain functions with radio magnetic waves. So when a politician stood up to make a speech, you zap him. And he either shits his pants or whips out his meat and masturbates in front of the electorate. How to win votes and influence people. Here's how it works. Contributions based on your earnings made regularly by you and millions of your fellow workers. These contributions are collected by the federal government. He quit tattooing, I think, in the early 50s. I believe it was in protest against the IRS because he was so pissed off that he had to pay a lot of taxes. And he said, screw it, I'm not going to work for the government. He was extremely anti-government. He was a real strong right-wing libertarian. So he told me that it was just a protest against paying taxes. He didn't want to work, as he put it, for nothing. During those years, I think he did a variety of things when he stopped tattooing. And one of them, he was skippering um, one of these tour boats, I think they might have been like huge catamarans that took tourists around. He told me terrific stories of working in the shipyards and he said he'd get back to his rooming house and there were guys lined up outside wanting a tattoo, probably other shipyard workers. 
and he'd have to go up the back stairway and try to sneak in because he was completely exhausted from working all day and try to get into his room and get some shut-eye before they could, he could grab him and say, come on, just put another one on me. In the Navy Yard, I thought I had a steel splinter in my ass, as it used to catch on my clothes. I went to the sick bay where they pulled it out with a big magnet. And there it was, my old tattoo needle, big as hell. Aloha means both farewell and greetings, and Hawaii bids farewell to 40 years of frustration and failure in attempts to win statehood, and joyously greets its new status as a full-fledged member of the Union, its 50th state. Hawaiian statehood gives the lie to communist charges of American colonialism. The big day was a long time in coming, which means that much more to celebrate. And then eventually he got back into tattooing in, I think, 1960. There was a guy named Bob Palm who had opened this shop on Smith Street, 1033 Smith. I think Bob made him a partner in the shop, and then Bob had to leave the islands. Bob got in trouble. Bob was a homosexual. And in those days, you know, it wasn't cool to be gay. And it certainly wasn't cool to get caught in some kind of love nest with some Marines. If you screwed up in Honolulu, they'd take you to the airport, you know, put you on a plane. Jerry bought the place really cheap. For I think a dollar, like a token thing. Then it became the Sailor Jerry Tattoo Shop, and this is where he really made his mark on, on tattoo history. Okay, I met Sailor Jerry at uh, 1033 Smith Street in Hawaii. I was a sailor on the LT-2080. I became an apprentice there with Jerry. He helped me out quite a bit. Gave me two tattoo machines. What else did you need? The shop was just a little teeny dive. It really was. It was off of the main drag of Honolulu, Hawaii. There was a huge titty bar that took up the whole bottom floor. So that was our waiting room, kind of. Strippers would be up there stumbling around high on reds and stuff. <laughs> God, it was a mess, man. Da, 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 boom, da, da, you know. It was flash, every corner that could be flashed. It was just big enough for two stations. It was very, very tight. That was the shop. That was Sailor Jerry's. By re-entering it, I think that he kind of reassessed what could be done with tattooing, and whereas he painted all this gorgeous flesh, done terrific, solid tattoos on people in the real folk Americana tradition. And one thing that was very important about Jerry is that he his attention to detail, his precision, the fact that he researched them nuts and bolts of like mechanical things, of like the Navy symbolism. Twin screws, it was a classic like joke tattoo that guys would have tattooed on their ass. He sent me this drawing of it, or maybe even a stencil of this thing, twin screws, you know, 40 knots, no smoke, twin screws, stands cl stand clear. And then he would put a notation on there about these must rotate in a certain direction. It was like the ships, the rigging had to be right. Probably the only tattooers I ever met that knew what all that stuff was when he tattooed it. He was light years ahead of most of the tattooers of his time. And tattooing in those days was basically black, red, green, and yellow. Jerry was the one that discovered purple as a tattoo pigment. Where in the hell is he getting purple ink? You were really in with Jerry if he gave you a little touch of purple to take home with you, you know. Here it is. You ever tell anybody about this, you're dead. You know, I'll never even talk to you again. You'll be shut out of the loop, you know. <laughs> this guy, Lou Norman, who he always loved to torture. He had a porn shop and a, and a tattoo shop. Lou Norman, who loved to get on TV, he'd get on there and yappity yappity yap and go, and the only color that you'll never be able to get to is purple. So Jerry started writing pigment companies for samples of purple. Finally, he hit on this stuff called Carbosol Violet. Now, you'd think that the guy was developing it because he wanted to have purple in his palette. But what he really wanted to do was he put a big purple dragon on a kid on his forearm and then had the kid go over to Lou Norman's shop after it was healed up with the long sleeve shirt on and go, I want to get a purple dragon on this. You know, and, the, and Lou Norman go, hey, you can't get purple. It's two boys and blah, blah, blah. And he went, I got one here. Lou Norman actually had the stroke over this purple ink. So Jerry has a good idea. He gets two dozen purple orchids and has them sent to the hospital to Lou Norman's. 
It almost killed him in the hospital. He was a, a really, oh, he was just so full of pranks. You know, he had these vendettas against a lot of tattooers, and, you know, it went beyond not just appreciating or, or giving any credence to their tattoo style. Locally, he hated Lou Norman worse than anybody. He claimed that Lou would always come around and be like big eye in his stuff. Oh my God, Jerry, how do you get that red in your flesh? Jerry told him, oh no, I'm using the same one you are, but I add sugar to the watercolor to make it, uh, he says it makes it more bright. Norman goes back to shop, paints the red in on all the sheets, leaves the shop, comes back the next morning, all the red's been eaten off the flesh by the cockroaches. In Honolulu there, I guess they have uh, these big cockroaches. They'll come right at you like, you know, they attack. Nobody knew anything about tattooing. Tattooing was so subculture and so like spooky and, you know, it really, I mean, the level, the intricate levels of bullshit and stories and stuff are part of the great thing about it, but there's a great tat story. Tats would do these things with everybody's working in a sponge in a bucket then. You know, there were no, they didn't change needles or anything. They didn't change ink. And somebody would get in the chair and they'd say, was this, is this sterile? And Tats would say, sterile, of course. And take this lucky, you know, out of his mouth or something. Dip it in there, psst. You know, he said, see that? It sterilizes that water, you know. <laughs> Nobody wore gloves in those days. You're up to your elbows, blood gore every day, man. You no rubber gloves or any of that bullshit, man. Let this fucking thing hurt, man. Wash it with alcohol. Wash it with alcohol. Ah, wash it with alcohol. I left my arm. Oh, I looked at it. Oh. The thing with Jerry was getting onto the sterile chain of events. When we went out of the dark ages of tattooing, which meant using the same tubes and needle bars and ink on everybody that came in the door over and over and over. We all knew, including Jerry at the time, that this was wrong. And the old school guys who, during the 60s, were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, weren't about to change. Before Jerry, everybody's tattoos got a big scab on them, like an oatmeal cookie, and it took a month for them to heal up. It's not a sanitized thing, so some of it's, you know, too bad. It's not like I long for the days when things weren't sterile, but it's just, it's very, very funny. It has this rich history of that thing, you know. He was a self-taught guy, an autodidact. He was a real smart kind of a guy, kind of a nerd in a way. Certain nerd qualities about him. He built me a, a power supply one time. We're gonna fix you up on the power supply. So he built these, all these, I don't know, all these diodes and crap, you know, and, and it was all mounted in pieces of aluminum and kind of taped together. It looked like a bomb. I used to have a lot of trouble bringing it on airplanes. He was super interested in, in electronics, and then with the computers were just starting to the dawning of the age of computer. Who knows what would have happened if Jerry would have lived into, you know, an ancient age. He would have been so into all this cyber technology because uh, he found it fascinating. Just called the radio talk show and told them about an article I read in the Intellectual Digest about computerizing sex. You can just go into Cyber Sex Studio anywhere in the world, put your favorite girls tape in the machine, connect up the sensor devices, and you are in business. So you can see and hear what you are screwing via electronics. I would have figured this out, but somebody beat me to the punch. More money in this than heroin. Dial a cunt. Instant fuck service. So Jerry had this, this radio show, All Night Talk Show, and I don't know how he wangled his way into it. It was called Old Ironsides. Jerry stayed on, I believe, from like midnight until maybe four in the morning. I don't know when he slept. And he would just talk all night and people would call in and I think maybe he'd play a little music, but mainly it was his political rant and reading his poetry and that stuff. He was a terrific like raconteur. He could tell stories and he could relate with people on tons of different levels. And it was amazing to see him switch gears. You know, every other word was God damn it and fuck this and yeah, cocksucker. And then he gets on the air and he had a really deep, beautiful air voice, terrific voice and gets into this smooth delivery, you know, for all these whatever lonely widows out there in the dark. He was amazing, a real, a real chameleon, a social chameleon. This is Veterans Day, but this is also a day when we as Americans should take a good look 
into the mirror of our consciousness. Take a good look at what you see and remember it forever. Remember those who are responsible for the humiliation of our great nation in the eyes of the world today. We, as a nation, are riding on the heavily burdened backs of our fighting men. They are not complaining. I am. Jerry was this extreme conservative, extreme right-winger. He's the only guy I ever met that hated Nixon because Nixon was too uh, liberal. I mean, he was really into all that America first kind of stuff, man. Love it or leave it. A lot of his ideals, a lot of what he wanted to do, attitudes toward people, toward colonialism, toward all kinds of stuff that were prevalent at, at the late 19th century, essentially. He chased more than one hippie out of there. I had to, like, kind of clean up the first time I went over there. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Communism. It's basic, godless philosophy. I think he actually bought some land in some remote island group way the hell out in the Pacific and like, I'm gonna get away from all these liberals and all these commies and all this stuff and these kinds of people. Now you know them, you know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. So the idea being, he was gonna get a big power boat. He's gonna arm it with a quad 50 gun. This is Sailor Jerry's story telling me this now. And what he wanted to do was attack and raid the pirate boats that were coming down to the islands and overpowering the pearl divers. This blew my mind. And you just listen to this stuff and you should buy land there. And you go, yeah, yeah okay. Oh, gee, what, what was the name of that place? You know. So it was, it was a, a weird thing. He'd been out there on this rock, and so it was easy to get a worldview going that maybe wasn't as informed as if you were connected either in a geographical or an intellectual sense or an informed sense with the way the rest of the world operated. They call it Asiatic fever. That's, you have a thousand yard stare on a hundred yard island. I mean, a lot of tattooers probably shared his outlook in that, let's face it, most of these guys were terrible racists, either overtly or, or covertly, more overtly. Uh, it's the way America was in those days, and it wasn't exactly drawing from a sophisticated, educated class of people, you know. They might have been smart, had street smarts, but they also were ferociously protective of their independent status. One reason Jerry hated Bert Grimm is because Bert was such a, he loved publicity. Jerry absolutely shunned publicity. He would not, I, he would throw people out of his shop. We're doing a little article on tattooing as a human interest. Get out, get the fuck out, you know. And whereas Bert, knew the value of publicity, and he would ham it up, and he'd get the St. Louis papers to write him up. Well, a lot of the old tattoo artists, the old school, for my school, I guess that was a, the, the new school then, you know? But I knew how to spell it, though. They spell it S-K-O-O-L nowadays. They had the, the mentality of hiding up a dark, dirty street and keeping as low a profile as possible, and in that way, the big, bad boogeyman, like the legislators or something, they wouldn't find you to outlaw. He had this huge vendetta against Lyle Tuttle. Lyle really was a disciple of Bert. He picked it because they're both like quintessential flim flam guys. And I say that with respect. You see that little blush, blush, there's a little blush, blush, blush right there. Yeah. That's the head of my dick. News editors would send a writer out, probably to dig up some dirt, who knows, but they would go out and, and talk to the tattoo artist discovered a guy down next to the Greyhound bus station that wasn't up a dark, dirty alley, hiding and keeping a low profile, but somebody that was the opposite. And he would diss Lyle for his, kind of his lifestyle, you know, in San Francisco, this, you know, hotbed of liberalism and everybody's favorite city. And the hippies decide to congregate there, right? A tuttle and all these weirdos in San Francisco. I was terrified the whole time I wrote to Jerry. I thought if he finds out that I'm a pothead, man, it's never, you know, it's, he'll never talk to me again, you know. If Johnson had been up there and he'd had two big tattoos on his forearm with his sleeves rolled up, given the Bay of Tompkins resolution, those hippies wouldn't have touched tattooing with a 10-foot pole. So I've always considered myself a product of timing. At the right time, the right guy at the right place at the right time. And then plus being tattooed all over. That was the selling point. I believed in my product. 
Lyle had been on the cover of Rolling Stone, and Jerry went ballistic. He hated Rolling Stone, of course. He hated the hippie thing. Jerry's toilet was really bad. And inside the lid, he pasted that photo of Lyle. I and mean, he took a photo of it and sent it to me. So he said, every time I piss, I'm pissing on Lyle Tuttle. The Lyle Turtle article makes me want to puke, too. He's in with the lefties, the pot pushers, the sensitivity trainers, and the rest of the un-American faction. It proves one point that the majority of the people are visually crippled and don't know art from shit. In the old days, there maybe were six or eight people that Jerry really respected and worshipped, and he had all this oral history in his head. He began developing more ambitious projects and had some contacts actually through a Japanese man who would travel through Hawaii. Mr. Kida was bringing Jerry photos from some of the famous Tokyo tattoo artists. There were no pictures of Japanese work available. It was very, very hard to see any of this stuff, but Jerry kind of had an in there. Jerry began corresponding with the Japanese tattoo masters, known as Horis. Soon, he was trading tattoo information with the famous Horiyoshi II and Horihide Kazugo Aguri. All the Japanese tattooers have a, an honorific term of Hori to dig or to carve. But Jerry was actually Hori Smoku, kind of a fake honorific. An idea of like a Japanese that couldn't say the L would say Holy Smoke, Hori Smoku. So it was, it was like a dig, you know, at the Japanese and then and also a way to give himself like a kind of a fake honorific, you know. He, he really got down on the Asian thing. Horiyoshi was real cloistered. He figured that what he did was not the same thing as the rest of these tattoo artists did in Japan. And his work was fucking insane. He could really tattoo. He wouldn't have anything to do with, the, with those guys. But did he ever like Jerry? He saw some of Jerry's work and he saw color like he'd never seen before. Japan has the right answer. You don't just walk in, lay your money down and get tattooed. They have to study your character first. And if they don't think you'll be a credit to the work they put on you, they turn you down cold. That's the way I'm taking it from here on in. Jerry's connection with Japan, it was interesting because he went through World War II, he, he really was he, he had a love-hate thing, but he respected Japan enough that he wanted to get close to it. He studied it, he studied the stories when he was in communication with these Japanese tattooers. He really wanted to learn, again, the analytical thing. How come whirlwinds turn that way? How come this kind of uh, kimono goes with this kind of character? But the undercurrent was, we're gonna learn this and we're gonna beat them at their own game. The look that Jerry really got famous for and made a huge impact is that he decided to get more and more devoted to fusing in the Japanese look. Probably the one factor about the, the look of Japanese tattoos is the fact that they were doing water shading with the idea of tonal, a greater tonal range instead of just black ink that you shade out. Ways that you would use a machine that you would draw out the tones. People weren't mixing the ink down. The Japanese were doing that and that's what Jerry started doing. He's very analytical about that. So this had a terrific impact. People saw those photos and thought, oh my God, this guy, you know, he just was pushing the envelope. He was doing sort of his version of Japanese work, but with an American flair, a different kind of a thing to it. What Sailor Jerry was able to do was be influenced by Japanese art, but make it his own. And that's what's so hard to do nowadays to take this idea of the Japanese layout, do a thing that, that, you know, segues into sections of your whole body, maybe even has the backgrounds of the whirlwinds, the waves, the lightning, all that stuff, but do classic American subjects. He said, you know, you can do Washington Crossing the Delaware, you can do, you know, Wild Bill Hickok, you could do all this stuff, because he consistently felt that you can't just blindly copy something. You have to take it and absorb it and learn all the rules and then transform it into something of your own. And that's why he was, frankly, so, friendly to me. It was at that period that I came into contact with Jerry. I started tattooing in 66. You know, I'd been crazy about tattooing when I was a little kid. My best friend's dad had a bunch of tattoos from World War II. We were always screwing around with like, well, let's play soldiers, let's play cowboys, let's play this. We were 10 years old, you know. Let's, let's do tattoos on people. We started drawing tattoos on neighborhood kids. We figured out that there were real tattoo shops up at the Pike. 25 miles up the coast from us in Long Beach. We started going up there and hanging out. So I was obsessed with tattooing from when I was 10 to about 
uh, almost 13, and then it was, I was, it was too little kid stuff painting on tattoos. So I dropped it. I'm in art school, and I got reinterested in tattooing. Whenever I got a tattoo, whoa, you know, a real tattoo. Oh shit! The next night I go back to another shop. I get a second tattoo. I was trying to find this guy Phil Sparrow. Finally, I go over to Sparrow's shop. The first day in there. He says, oh, you're an art student. He says, you want to see real art tattooing? Look at this. It's a book of photos of Japanese tattooing. It just flipped my head. Wow, Japanese tattooing? Is anybody really doing Japanese work? And he said, well, there's this guy, Sailor Jerry, in Honolulu. And there's these photos of Jerry's work, and there's some tracings of rub-offs of Jerry's, a little bit of flash, and these photos of this guy, John Breen, that he did these legs on, and some other big pieces. Totally blew my mind. So, of course, then that's the quest. This is a holy grail. I got to meet Sailor Jerry. Well, Honolulu was so remote and exotic in those days. You know, it was not like a stop on the, on the road like it is now for the world shrunk. I'm going to write Sailor Jerry a letter. I sent him photos of my work, and I didn't hear back. And I was just like, oh, shit. Then I go down to Seattle to meet Zeke Owens, who had a shop there. And Zeke was another guy, brilliant tattooer, and actually was good friends with Jerry. I got in trouble in California again. I don't know, I beat up a couple of cops out there in San Diego. I'm sorry guys, I was drunk. I met Jerry about uh, 1964 or 65 when I went to work in uh, Honolulu in Chinatown. And I was apparently the only guy in the States at the time that could call him and talk to him. And uh, I worked in his shop a few times. That was a real privilege. So anyway, I guess Ed got over there, got him hooked up for a little while. And then I wrote Jerry. Zeke told me to write you, and Jerry really respected Zeke. And through a whole series of contortions, I finally was able to establish a correspondence with him. And then the first time he sent me some photos, I just, you know, I, I lost it. It was like, oh my God, you know, this is, this is phenomenal. We kept corresponding, and, um, you know, we were rolling toward really sharing everything we knew about this stuff and firing each other up, you know, it was exciting. And we just, you know, fused. I was the guy that he realized, I mean, he was sharing a lot of stuff with Zeke. He shared stuff, of course, with older tattooers he was in touch with. But I was the first guy that had come along that had been to art school. I had, like, formal education. Not that it made me better, but it was just a different take on, on art. And at that point, we were looking for a location. We were gonna, he was calling it like the Mid-Pacific Tattoo Institute. We were gonna have like a private room for the Japanese style work. Gonna do the, and his attitude was as usual, you know, blow all these other motherfuckers out of the water. He says, we'll show them what we can do, you know. And it was, it was great. Ed was Jerry's number one. Jerry invested a lot of time in Ed really encouraged him. He was very proud of how good he got. And Ed got a lot of breaks from Jerry, a lot of important stuff that, that Ed learned, he learned from Jerry, you know. I mean, they used to write each other like almost daily. You know, there wasn't that many real creative tattooers in those days. One day I pick up the paper and there's a story about how the Museum of American Folk Art is gonna do a show about tattooing. I come in, I say, listen, I got a lot of pictures and stuff of tattooing. Next thing you know, I'm working on a contemporary half of this show. I get a hold of Ed Hardy, and Hardy is hooked up with Jerry. I phone up Jerry, terrified. Uh, Jerry was famous for not dealing with media of any kind, but he wasn't stupid, you know, he wasn't a stupid guy, and he saw, hey, Museum of American Folk Art, pretty soon in the mail comes a whole shit house of pictures and drawings. They were really impressive. The man's vision had, you know, he ex, you know, everything, the lines were nice, the color was all solid and beautiful. I was like, wait a minute, tattooing can be like that? The possibilities just started to reel in my mind, holy, you know. Because I knew right away that they that the surface hadn't been scratched. And I mean, right away I put together, we can take this into the 20th century and it could be fun, you know. The old Kempo custom is to teach your students and help them improve. But always hold back the death blow special for emergency. And when they challenge you, they never know what hit them. Sneaky old bastard. One reason I wanted to go to Hawaii and work with Jerry, not only to be with him, but I saw Hawaii as a stepping stone to get to Japan, which was really what I was after. He had introduced me to Kazuo Oguri and um, uh, 
really got me hooked up and, and able to get an invite to Japan. Uh, Oguri had come over to Jerry's house in December of 72, and we had kind of a little mini convention. This is in the years before tattoo conventions. Uh, Des Connolly from Australia, and Michael Malone and I, and Mike's girlfriend uh, came over from San Diego. We all kind of came over at the same time for about a week to kind of pay homage to the old man. And Oguri got there last. So we all went down and Jerry's, he had a, one of those Thunderbirds, it was painted bright yellow, and he drove it like a demon. So we go out to the airport, we get Oguri. He heads right back to town. He's driving way too fast, scaring everybody to death. He finally gets to a overlook kind of place. There it is, all laid out the whole Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, the whole thing. Kazuo, Pearl Harbor. We were like, oh, Jesus. So we were all staying at Jerry's house. It was great fun. When we were all together at Jerry's house, and I was watching Oguri hand outline this dragon and chrysanthemums on Malala, I was just totally taken with it. And Jerry came through the living room, and Jerry made some crack some smart ass thing about the Japanese or about Oguri or whatever. Oguri didn't understand really any English, you know. And I, re and I remember clearly, you know, I turned around and gave Jerry this stink eye like, this is the great tattoo master, you know, I was like so offended. And Jerry just looked at me and then he said, it's been nice knowing you, you know. And he could see that I was like, that was gonna be my new God, you know, working with Oguri. He was mad, the old man, about that. <laughs> I think maybe that was one of the reasons he went off to Japan. There's a, an old saying about that you're, someday your idols will get clay feet. Well, that idol's sitting out there in the jungle in, in wet ground and that limestone and stuff they make the idols out of starts turning back into mud and falls over. Anyway, I, I, Oguria, during that trip meeting in Hawaii, it was just a few days really, and Oguria invited me to come to Japan and work with him. Ed Hardy who worshiped Sarah Jerry, went to Asia. Went there, I got pictures of him in kimonos, dancing in Japanese parades, and you know, fucking crazy son of a bitch. <laughs> the old man was brokenhearted about that. He had lost his zing, you know. He was proud that I made the leap into Japan, but it was kind of like, you know, he didn't kick me out of the nest, it's like I jumped. He was very excited about opening that Mid-Pacific Tattoo Clinic with Ed. He really had, he and Ed were gonna kill the world. With his protege gone to the greener pastures of Japan, Jerry returned alone to 1033 Smith Street. The rugged years of high seas adventure and hotel street mayhem had taken its toll on the old master yet he remained in raw character till the end. He'd recently bought a Harley and came out, was feeling real weird, laid down in the parking lot next to the motorcycle and had a heart attack. Waking up on the floor of this place and going, oh, what the hell's going on? And he got up and kicked the Harley and rode home on it, you know. But by the time he got home that night, he was real sick. And his wife was a nurse. She put him to bed for a couple of days and he came back downtown and went to a Chinese herbalist. You know, they give him a bag full of lizard tails and, you know, toad eyes and I don't know, you know. Then he decided that it was, he, he thought he was going to check out. So he uh, talked to his wife, Louise, and told her how he wanted the shop disposed me, Ed, or Zeke, or burn it. I was working for Zeke in San Diego. Ed was in Japan. And I got the news actually about two weeks late that Jerry had died and his widow was trying to get hold of me because I was first in line to get the shop and I didn't want to leave Japan at that time. Zeke thought that $20,000, there was no tattoo shop ever made that was worth $20,000. And I thought different. I thought it was well worth $20,000. If I hadn't taken it, it would have all been burned because he didn't want anybody to have it that he didn't approve of, you know. Uh, Mike um, moved on the spur of the moment, and he renamed it China Sea Tattoo when he 
took it over as a homage to Jerry's thing on the China Sea. To be there with only two or three years experience and then just having just deluge with customers. I mean, it was crazy. I worked in Jerry's tomb for like 25 years or something. The first year or two that I was in there working, people would come by and go, where's Jerry? You know? At first I'd go, oh, you know, Jerry passed away you know, a few months ago. Six months went by, people would come in, where's Jerry? Oh, Jerry passed away. Yeah, passed away about six months ago. You know? By the time a year went by, people would come in and go, where's Jerry? Oh, Jerry's been pushing up daisies for a year. Jesus Christ. What are you, the last to find out about it? One of the things that I think is important about tattooing is that it really harks back to the artisans, if you want, to like a medieval or a renaissance outlook where the particular medium that you worked in was a discipline, that it was a thing that you had to work to get your entry into this world. It was very hermetic. It's like, okay, well, if you're going to work in this, you're going to learn it this way, you're going to do this, do this, do this, and you're going to realize that you're part of a lineage, and it's something that's virtually non-existent in the contemporary world and a lot of the younger tattooers anybody that's worth a shit deserves to be in this racket should embrace that the ones that don't i don't have any use for it but the inner thing about being part of a tradition and respecting your teachers is is very important so to me anyway you know it's what makes tattooing strong and interesting and helps balance out all the totally wacky shit that's in it you know? <laughs> that's what I'm 19, and uh, it just felt like okay. we're going to war in maybe a year. So I'll be 20 then. Hopefully to get activated for the war. Nervous. Nervous for the tattoo or for war? <laughs> you know, I'd started making tattoo machines on my own, like really flying blind, not really knowing what I was doing, and I was painting Flash without really having any idea what I was doing. I was corresponding with Mike Malone when he was in Hawaii. Very old timey, you know, all letters, you know, no phone calls. He'd write me back and, you know, I'd send him pictures of what I'd done or copies of what I'd done and he'd write me back and tell me how horrible I was and that I should quit. I mean, he was brutal, just absolutely fucking brutal to me. And uh, I'd always just write him back and say, thank you, you know? I mean, you know, the customers, all they do is tell me how good I am, you know? I need somebody to tell me how rotten I am. He wrote me a letter, do you know any young tattooers want to work for a crotchety old man? And I was like, fuck, yeah, I'm there. You know, but I'm definitely of that sort of black t-shirt generation of tattooers. You know, there's tens of thousands of us that are to, to the old the old guys, we all look the same, you know, we're all cool guying it around with black t-shirts. Just sort of learned a lot of stuff that a lot of kids don't know. Tattooing nowadays, you don't have to know any of that shit. You know, you can pretty much buy your needles pre-made, buy your ink pre-made, buy your machines pre-built, you know, buy your flash pre-drawn. You know, you don't need to know any of those old skills that those tattooers needed to know. Because that knowledge is going to fade away. But what I always kind of made me love tattooing was that sort of criminal aspect, you know, like all of it being real legitimate now is not, I don't necessarily think a great thing, you know, I mean, I really like the rough and tumble tattoo shop image of what I remember or what I've heard. You know, my way may not be the only way, it's the only way you'll get from me. I heard Dan Higgs say that once, and I think it's fantastic. Jerry remained in love with tattooing. He loved in, he remained in love with what tattooing could be, with the good aspects of it, and the kind of nobility of it, for lack of a better word. He was enthusiastic about tattooing. He wasn't cynical about it. He was cynical about the people, most of the people in tattooing. He didn't have any respect for them, but he, he was cynical because he saw it as something that deserved respect, and he just figured they were bums, you know, which most of them were. You know, most of them still are. There's just more of them, you know. Paul Rogers early on told me, he said, it's always been this way. He said, tattooing's like a pyramid. He says, there's always, there's a few guys right at the top that are really, really important, really doing great stuff, you know, like Jerry. And then there's like a little thin layer of people that are just good workers, and Paul classed himself as that. And he said, and he said, and then underneath that is just, and Paul is total North Carolina hillbilly accent. He said, underneath that, there's just this great big heap of bums holding it all up, you know. This popularity that it has today has got to wane. The kid that's suckling a bosom right now, 
little baby is try and get in focus this butterfly that his mother has on her breast while he's feeding. He'll probably grow up with some type of an eye affliction. Then he gets to the um, kindergarten and his kindergarten teacher flashes her wares and shows a butterfly she's got on her butt. So by the time that kid grows up, tattooing is going to be an establishment item to him. And it'll be the last thing he want to do is get a tattoo. So I think we're going to reap a crop of people that are untattooed one of these days. As we become more advised and more, more advanced. advanced, that's a nice word. Uh, it's the same fucking doorbell. The basic design is the same. It's the different. same as you design a kiss. Never mind, I'm going to bend you over. <laughs> Never mind, I'm going to stick my tongue down your throat. <laughs> Never mind the French kiss. <laughs> Never mind. Jesus, you get diseases. What the hell are we talking about? <laughs> Do you know, I really don't think I want to copy this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, who are you? Is I'm Nasty Mike. Who are you? I said, I'm Crazy Eddie, you motherfucker. What are you throwing knives at my friend for? He said, I don't like him. But I like you, he says. I said, good, I'm glad. <laughs> they can fuck the same thing just year after year after year. They talk about same-sex marriage. If you're with one long enough, it's same-sex marriage. Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, I'd have their pants down quicker than the guy had been going out with him for six months, you know. Of course, I always liked the view. I, one time I was in a shirtless in my tattoo shop, and this sailor came in with his Japanese bride, and she read my tattoo and says, Oh, maybe you know gonna die. And I didn't understand. I'd never heard that before. <laughs> but I have survived a lot of crap, so. He broke in on that tradition, which was really exemplified probably by Captain Coleman. And are you picking that up? Because, of course, when I said, oh, it's so quiet here, some fucking guy would start. Can you, is that coming through? The long and the short and the tall. Fuck all the captains and all the mates, too. Fuck the engineers and the whole goddamn crew. We're saying goodbye to them all. As back to our rust pots we crawl. We'll start a commotion that side of the ocean. So cheer up, my lads, fuck them all.